Okay, so what the heck did we just learn over the past 15 sessions? There was a lot of material that we covered in this class, um, and that's the nature of an introduction to microeconomics class. Um, in a, if you got a master's degree in microeconomics itself, um, you would take a class in labor economics or in environmental economics or health economics, where you'd spend the whole semester on just that one aspect of um, externalities and fixing pollution and, and carbon emissions. Um, in this class, we didn't do that. We were just all over the place. And that's just the nature of an introduction class. You had to learn about um, indifference curves and budget lines. You had to learn about all these other things. Um, to then talk about market failures and all of the other things we've talked about in the past few sessions. So if we look back at the course objectives from the syllabus for the class, um, the whole goal of this class was to help you do these things here, to understand the principles of microeconomics. Hopefully you do that now. Um, you understand why, like how we make decisions under scarcity, where we're trying to maximize our utility um, by finding the best trade-offs between two goods so that we're the happiest. Um, other principles, we have to figure out where supply and demand meet. That's a market equilibrium. That can get distorted. There's deadweight loss. That's all kind of incorporated in those principles. Um, the other thing here is you were supposed to be able to explain social phenomena using economic vocabulary and reasoning. And based on the uh, weekly reports that you've been turning in and your different problem sets, I think you've hit that. Um, you're all using this economic language in your responses and understanding it and communicating that understanding. And it's fantastic to see um, all of the, the things you've learned. Um, to predict how individuals respond to incentives, um, hopefully now you understand that incentives are very important, um, that if there are intrinsic motivations, you can actually crowd those out with extrinsic ones and make it so people no longer do the right thing um, because it becomes a market transaction. Um, you can predict what people do in response to specific um, incentives, and that's cool. You have that ability to do that now. Um, these last two um, points here to justify government intervention in the free market um, and to identify when public policies have worked or not worked. Um, we've been covering this in the past few sessions. Hopefully now you know the conditions for a market failure and different types of market failures and how um, the government and the private sector and the informal sector and the nonprofit sector can all help fix those issues um, and help address those issues. And based on your responses and your different problem sets, um, I think you've got that. So good job, everybody. Um, if we look back to the roadmap that we had at the beginning of the semester, um, just to look back at what we did, we started off talking about these broader concepts of capitalism and markets and how they work. Um, we focused a lot on fairness and inequality, on this idea of social dilemmas and how to map these things out with game theory. Then we moved into the nitty gritty world of economic models, where we had indifference curves and budget lines and supply and demand curves. Um, and then, based on all that boring nitty gritty stuff, we moved up into this fun world of looking at market failures and how to fix them and um, the importance of institutions in fixing them um, and when governments can go wrong um, and when they can go right. So we went through that whole map, you made it and you've learned a lot. Um, in a few weeks, you're not gonna remember lots of this stuff. Um, that's okay, that's just the nature of learning a ton of stuff all at once. Um, the main takeaways that I want you to remember from this class are these here. Um, you have learned some key economic principles and you think differently. So even though you're not going to map out budget lines and indifference curves in your head um, in the future, you're still going to change how you make decisions. You're going to think about scarcity. Um, and this, this happens to pretty much everybody who learns economics. You'll no longer think just um, normally. You'll, not, you'll now start thinking like an economist. And so if you have to make a trade-off between two different activities, um, you'll start thinking about opportunity cost and is it worth it to do this or not? Um, is it worth it to mow the lawn now or should I have one of my kids do it or should I hire somebody to do it? Should I wash my car now or should I have, um, should I take it to a car wash and let them do it? What's the opportunity cost? And even if you don't draw the indifference curves in your head, you're still going through that same process. Um, you'll now think about market fail failures differently. When you see things like carbon taxes, you'll know that that is actually trying to fix the marginal damage and it's a Pigovian tax um, trying to shift the, the private marginal cost up to the social marginal cost. And it is um, trying to get the, the people who are polluting to internalize the externality. You now have that language to, to, to talk about this stuff and you can, 
you can think about that differently. Um, the second main takeaway is this idea of institutions. We've talked about this throughout the semester. Um, social phenomena that you see are very messy and complicated. Um, the existing institutional structures that we have are based in part in history and in path dependency, and so it's really hard to get them to change. Um, and so being able to think institutionally is a very important skill um, because one, um, you'll be able to, to hopefully address these things at an institutional level, which will have much broader implications than if you're just trying to fix things at an individual level and, tr and change individual behavior. That's not going to have kind of lasting social change. Um, and two, you'll, you'll recognize when you're running up into institutional issues. Um, for many of you, if you go on to become a manager at some new organization, you'll want to impose the cool new tricks that you've learned throughout your MPA and your MPP program um, about proper management. And then you're not going to be able to implement every single one of those things because of existing institutional ruts that exist. Um, path dependency is just kind of it's a thing and so getting away from that is going to be difficult um, but now you have language to describe that and ways of, of restructuring those institutions to make it so you can make reforms and changes and then finally the analysis side um, you can draw supply and demand graphs you can figure out the triangles for deadweight loss you can figure out tax burden you can figure out all of that fun stuff um, and also hopefully you've learned that all of this stuff is very limited um, it is important to do this stuff, but um, the numbers that you're getting are not always going to be super accurate, and you're not going to be able to, to make every perfect decision based on data that you have because the data and these models um, are not ideal. Um, and so you're hopefully aware of those limitations now. Um, so these are the main takeaways from the class. Hopefully you've hit those, and if you think back on this class a few months from now, as long as you remember these general topics, it will have been a success and, it, and I will be happy. <laughs>